Hello, my name is Carol May Whittick and welcome to Her Conversations, Tools for the Awakening Woman. HER is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. This is the optimal state to embody in order to attract our highest desires. And who is the awakening woman? Well, she is the woman who's seeking greater possibility in her reality and is looking for solutions. She knows being awakened is not just a lofty ideal, but a necessity. If she can transform herself, then she can change the world. Her conversations will introduce you to talented women who will speak to your spirituality, your sensuality and your soul. They share their stories and explain how they are in service to the world. So let their words and these conversations embolden and inspire you. This week's guest is Charlene Linton of My Vocal Therapy. After years of working as an in-demand singer for some of the biggest names in the music industry, she founded her own unique way of serving her clients as a vocal therapist. During our conversation, Charlene shares how she overcame her own shyness and followed her passion for music. We also hear how she witnessed the real pressures that artists face and how she discovered the tools to assist them. Even if you're not a performer, there will be takeaways for you within this episode as Charlene shares tips and exercises that anyone can use to develop a connection and confidence in embodying their own voice. So as always, I begin each episode by asking the question, HER is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. When do you feel at your most HER? So uh, even thinking about it, you know, I kind of just drop into my body and I relax. Um, And what I'm experiencing now is me at my highest energetic resonance. And if you'd asked me this question a couple of months ago, I would have said, you know, when my company is doing well and when I've got all the, the success and everything else, But what I really, really am understanding more and more recently that the truth of who I am is when I am soft and when I am kind to myself and when I am compassionate, not just to everybody else, because I'm really good at doing that, but to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even talking about it makes me want to tear up because it's... It's the, it's the least resistant thing in the world to me, to be soft. And when, I'm, when I am just strong, when I am just all of these fierce attributes, and I don't return to softness, it, it, it feels like pressure, and it feels hard. And you're able to have the success without the pleasure of having the success, which is why you want the success in the first place. Mm -hmm. And the truth of who I am is I've always been a sensitive soul. And And I used to believe that it was such a weakness of mine. You know, I was such a sensitive child. And it was a thing where I was chided for. Um, Nobody really got it. Nobody really understood it. And I then pushed that side of me away from myself in an effort to reject it, in an effort to correct it. And recently I've just been bringing all of those pieces that I've been rejecting, bringing them into myself to form something really whole and something really soft. And it's the easiest, most frightening thing of all to be that vulnerable. But it's so inviting to me. I can't think how inviting it could be to everybody else. Or perhaps not. (laughs) Everyone will have their take on that. But to me, it feels like ah, oh, like I've arrived at myself, and that is when I am at my most highest in my energy, um, for sure. That's beautiful. Thank you. And it's interesting as well that as um, 
I, I encountered the same um, accusation to call it being yeah. like a very, very sensitive kid, you know, and yeah. being like, you're too sensitive, like it's the worst. Mm-hmm. Thing the and the thing is, as, as you, as you become more into yourself, you realize that sensitivity is an openness and in itself a strength because what you get from being sensitive allows you to be all of those things. And I'm sure, you know, you, you will know, especially as a performer, you can't be anything but sensitive if you really want to, you know, push yourself or not, not even push yourself, be available and, and people will connect to you if you allow yourself to be sensitive. So it is, and it's good that more, more of us are, are recognizing that the softness is the strength, basically. It's that it's when yeah, people are being hard is usually out of some sort of fear that they're doing that and if we can open up you know look at the beauty that we can bring into the world and the space Mm -hmm. that we can offer when we're being that and with the work that you do now tell us more about you know how you got through the journey of your life to where you are today and what you offer today well um it's really interesting because I remember having a chat with one of my aunties And she said to me, I would never have guessed that you would have ended up on stage for a living because I was so shy as a kid. Sometimes I barely spoke. Um, I was locked in fear, you know, with my voice. And whenever there was an opportunity for me to sing in church, I would just cry because I was just petrified of it all. And I mean, I sang in church as I got older. But in groups, I would never sing on my own. And um, I did my psychology degree and I was about to do my master's. So I was on the interview for the master's course. And I was uh, for um, counselling psychology, MA, MSc, sorry. And I was actually bored on the interview. And I was like, this isn't, this isn't right. If I'm bored on the interview, this isn't right. And um, I got offered two out of three places that I interviewed for. And I deferred my place to go into music and never went back. <laughs> and um, I got into session singing um, again behind the artist, in the background, not singing solo. Whenever I went to an open mic night, all my friends would get up and sing and I never would. Um, Until I was like, you're gonna have to let people hear you, you know, if you really want to work. And so I had to overcome my shyness by making a decision. Um, You know, do you wanna make a living from this? Do you wanna make money from this? Um, or do you want to be shy, you know? (laughs) And so I had to really make that decision um, to be more outgoing and to sing solo, go to open mic nights and sing and make friends. Um, And then, um, so I started off in gospel and then um, I was singing with this, um, there was this artist, and um, this soul artist, I'd sung with her before, and um, I was invited to a show of hers at the Jazz Cafe. And I'll never, <laughs> I'll never forget that night, because um, even though I wasn't singing with her anymore, um, you know, I was quite friendly with the management and the band and stuff. And so I went down to this show, and for some reason, I knew that I was going to be asked to sing. Now, bear it in mind, I am no longer with this singer or in this band um, due to politics and stuff like that. But I just had this feeling and it was unshakable. It was undeniable. I was doing my makeup extra carefully. I was warming up my voice from my home. um, And I made my trip to the jazz cafe and I stood where she could see me because in my head I was like, well, you can ask me to sing. So (laughs) you're going to have to see me. And um, she was doing her set and midway through, sure enough, she looked down at me and she said, I know that you can sing. And she handed me the microphone. So I started to sing like my life depended on it. And the, the people on the jazz cafe floor, they parted like the Red Sea and everyone was watching me. And I'm singing, I'm going for it. And um, 
after the gig, um, the drummer was the MD for Craig David. And he said to me, that was your audition, come on tour with me. Mm. And that's how I got started in the pop side of things. So it was um, Craig David and Corinne Bailey Ray and Natasha Bedingfield and it just snowballed um, until I got to the Oscars in 2013 with Adele. Um, you know, we toured the album 21. Um, and I did, you know, many things after that as well. And um, during that time, I was able to see firsthand the kinds of things that recording artists go through. And so let's rewind a little bit to 2011. Um, I was in Utah with Adele. We were backstage about to go on. We were like in this holding area before we went on stage. And I remember band was there. Adele was over there and I looked at her and I smiled and she quickly averted her eyes from me. And I was like, oh, what's all that about? I was like, she's a bit rude, but, um, you know, I'm only smiling at you kind of thing. And um, I mentioned it to the guitarist. I was like, is she OK? You know, and then after the gig, um, we were talking about it and he said, oh, no, don't take that personally. She's petrified. She has stage fright. Mm -hmm. And that's when it started to click. When we were on stage, she used to regularly ask for the house lights, house lights to be turned up so that she could see people's faces. She hated at that time doing festival crowds. It was just too overwhelming for her. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if Adele can suffer like this, then anybody can, because she's one of the biggest stars in the world. And whatever she touches, turns to, to magic, it seems. And that's when I, I said to myself, I'm going to start a company to help recording artists, not just with their voice, because your voice is in a body. It's governed by your mind. I'm going to help them with their well-being. Mm -hmm. I'm going to help them eliminate nervousness. I'm going to help them remember who they are, remember how valuable that they are, so that they actually earn more monetary value. And it's going to be amazing. And um, the following year, I, I registered my company domain name, um, myvocaltherapy.com. Mm. And I really wanted to build it so that I'm not just a vocal coach, another one. There are loads of them out there, and they're all doing an amazing job. And so I called myself a vocal therapy coach because I wanted it to be very clear that I don't just work with the voice. I work with the mind. I work with trauma. I work with addiction. And I work with, with helping artists feel so ridiculously amazing about who they are that they don't need to numb with alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't need to put up with crap because there's, there's a lot of crap to put up with in the music industry it's it's treacherous mm -hmm. out there it's 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 uh it's an industry like no other you can have extreme highs and extreme lows all in the same year you know um and you're either being built up by the media and you're amazing or they're gonna tear you down it's an it's an incredibly um roller coaster ride in terms of your emotions and how does one navigate that how does one navigate winning the x factor and then being dropped how do you manage that so you're being recognized on the tube but in reality you're broke because you're no longer i don't how how does the 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 mind reconcile that and so my compassion goes out to recording artists and especially those at a high level who are in a celebrity bubble who don't have access to things that they should have because they are in a bubble and they're very guarded or they have too much access 
to things that are incredibly dangerous for them with a team who will say yes to them because they want to keep their jobs. So yeah, that's the journey in a, in a nutshell. And that's interesting, you know, because obviously when you're a fan of music or when you're not working right in the center of the industry as it is, it's painted so glamorously that, you know, it would be inconceivable for anyone to think, well, how, can pos how could Adele possibly be petrified when everybody loves her? It's like, you know, she's got that personality. It's like you can't imagine her giving it, going out and, and having like a huge kind of nervous nervous feeling when everyone has turned up and gone out of their way and traveled miles to be there and 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 that's one of the things that we when you're on the outside and you're looking in it's something so glamorous and something so amazing and so many aspire to be part of it they don't understand and and you mentioned um also trauma and addiction how do you see that those things either feed in to make a better artist because it, it seems sometimes the ones that are at their most vulnerable to the point of their expressing their trauma or they're living through addiction. Um, how, how do those things help? And obviously we know how they hinder, but how, how, mm. how do you help them in those places? Well, I went away and um, obviously I have a psychology background, but I went away and I trained in something called EFT. And so for those who don't know, it stands for emotional freedom technique. And it works um, like the psychological version of acupuncture. And it's a very swift method to help get to the core of trauma and really eliminate the emotional charge. Mm -hmm. So rather than using needles, you tap with your fingers. Some people call it tapping as well. And there are spots all over the body that relate to different organs and different things. And you'll be able to remember your trauma, but it won't have that same emotional charge around it. It won't have that same distress around it. You'll be able to know that that happened. And 99.99999% have experienced some sort of trauma mm. from the mild to the extremely severe but you'll be able to not have that thing have control over you mm -hmm. and so when i when i listen to recording artists write songs about the traumatic things that have happened it can be such a cathartic experience you know to get that out there um, but there's another step beyond that and the step beyond that is to be able to heal from it where it doesn't have that charge any longer. And you can still sing about it, but it no longer has dominion over you um, and your system. Um, and, you know, because of trauma, people overeat, people undereat. Um, people, like I said, they suppress with drugs and alcohol. You know, there's nothing wrong with having a drink. But have it because it's pleasurable for you, not because you're trying to get away from something else. That makes it not pleasurable. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes the hangover a sure thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, um, it makes the come down from drugs a sure thing because you're trying to run away from something and that's not pleasure. Yeah. And how did you come across EFT? It's one of, one of those things that I've been aware of for a long time seen videos mm. and tried different things how did that kind of come into your your awareness and how did you see that it was going to be useful as something that you could use with your vocal therapy it's funny because i was doing um, backing vocals for the great britain entrant for uh eurovision mm -hmm. this is like in 2014 and um one of my colleagues, one of my, you know, he's a, he's a good friend of mine. He was saying that he had tried it. And I remember using it on myself on the trip because I remember, and I'm just going to be honest, um, feeling a level of displacement and 
frustration, feeling like, not feeling as in love with doing backing vocals as I used to. Mm -hmm. Fully knowing that it's such a respectable profession and, and there are so many nuances in doing, in doing backing vocals. But feeling like, mm, I'm not quite in love with this as I used to. Um, with full respect for the artist and full respect for the team. Um, and I remember using on myself mm -hmm. on that trip just to relieve myself of any negative emotion. And what is really, really interesting is I remember being in my hotel room, feeling that level of frustration. And I remember, I didn't really know what I was doing. I kind of vaguely knew the points that I was tapping on and just tapping on them and feeling a lot better, feeling like, ah, oh, I'm back in the room, you know? And immediately after that first tapping session, the artist called my room and she said, Shah, I need you. I need you to coach me. And I'm not there as a coach. There was a coach already assigned to her. But she asked me and I was like, whoa, what, what's happened here? I literally, as soon as I stopped tapping, my phone rang in the hotel room. And I thought to myself, this is interesting. Negative emotions block opportunities and positive emotions invite. And I, it blew me away. So I was like, right, I'm training in this. <laughs> I have to train in this. And so the following, I think it was February, I found a course in London and I did all the requirements for the course. And I was like, this is so powerful. I don't want to be a coach that just talks about stuff. And no, it'll be, it'll be all right. Oh, don't be nervous. The, that stuff means nothing. To, to an artist who is debilitated with fear. Let's change this on the spot quickly so that you can go on stage and rock it out. You know, you don't have to get to the root of trauma right now, but you're nervous. You're feeling a certain way. Let's change that, reverse that emotional state so that you can get on stage and experience pleasure. Because that's what it's all about for me. It's about getting to that place of pleasure. Um, when you're straining with your vocal or you're so tired from your schedule, that's not pleasure. Mm -hmm. So how can we weave some pleasure into your life so that you're enjoying it now and not just when you get off on tour and you collapse because you're so tired and you sleep for a week. How can you enjoy it right now? That's brilliant. And one of the things obviously, um, a lot of people who will listen to this will be creative. Not every single person who listens to this will be a singer as such. Um, but we all have a voice, you know, and for some people there's a connection just on the connection to their voice in, in their everyday life before they even want to go out and perform in any way. What, what can we use? How can we start to get over whatever traumas or kind of use our traumas as a tool to move forward and and embody our voice just even when when you speak because i'm sure as a singer you'll speak to people um and you can tell where they place their speaking voice as to what's going on in their bodies like what what's absolutely that well the first thing is to become really aware of how you're using your voice because there are a lot of public speakers out there um and there are a lot of um, public speaking courses mm -hmm. that give you tips and tools on how to project and all of that. But my thing is, if you embody confidence, if you embody this person who is attractive, then people will believe that you are confident and people will be attracted to listen to you mm -hmm. without even the tips and techniques that stuff will be a bonus because you're just a living, breathing embodiment of someone who's very attractive and someone who's respectable. But one thing that I'm doing with one of my clients now um, is I got her to 
be aware of what's happening with her voice during the day. So she noticed that certain times in her working day, her voice would get tight. Or um, there could be other times when your throat gets really dry. Just kind of notice that, you know, and notice what is happening during those times. What causes your voice to become tight or become dry? Kind of have a look and, you know, was it during an argument or was it you were thinking about something? And because those things are the clues. It's like Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs. You know, you follow the breadcrumbs to see what the, what the, the, the reason is. Um, because the voice is not just about speaking and communication. It's about personal power. And um, there is definitely a link between people not using their voice to speak their truth linked to a lack of personal empowerment. They don't feel like they are worthy enough to say no or to have boundaries or worthy enough to stand up for themselves. Um, There's definitely a link there. And so the voice is just the audible manifestation of what's going on in your mind, what's happening in your subconscious mind. And the voice just is just the clue for me to kind of get in inside there and, and think um, what's happening here. Um, so yeah, it's like I said, it's, it's like Hansel and, and Gretel breadcrumbs, following those clues um, to see where you can be more bolstered in your subconscious mind about yourself and when you are feeling your most empowered you use your voice you just do it's the the vocal folds are more connected you you um you don't use your thin folds so much like thin folds for those who are not aware is when you're singing in falsetto or your head voice you're singing quite high it's quite a thin voice but also when you're speaking, it's like, ah, oh, you're lots of air is coming out and, you know, and, oh, I'm really sorry. You know, you're quite apologetic. And um, when you are um, speaking or singing with a thick, full voice, the sound is thicker. Um, it's more certain and it's more assertive. So, yeah, um, the first step is definitely awareness for sure. I know for some people that might be a lot. I mean, I've in the past had vocal training and I know when I first started to feel where my chest voice was and just mm-hmm. kind of move my talking voice because I used to talk quite high. I used, my voice used to be mm-hmm. pitched up here a little bit. So okay. it was a matter of pulling it down and starting to speak and just feeling the vibration move through my chest. Yeah. And even at the beginning for me, um, you know, for, I remember for a first for about three or four weeks, all, all that my vocal teacher would do would have me growl. Literally, we were growling this song, we were doing this boots were made for walking, and just growl and growl and growl and growl and growl, until it got to the point where I could start to feel it moving in my chest. And for me, that was, it was almost quite frightening, you know, mm. to creating that kind of vibration within myself. And I hadn't yeah. realized that I hadn't, wasn't even there. I mean, are there, and it, those are things that I know that I was able to do. And then when I was able to bring tone to it, then yeah. it was like, okay, this is what I haven't been doing because before it had been very light and it being kind of floaty and I wasn't really able to control it because it wasn't connected to anything. And then when it started to really pull down and it started to, so you could you know embody it and feel it then that was it but it took a moment to really get used to it because when you start to feel your own power of your own voice as well that's not something that everyone is able to do especially if they've spent a long time you know like being the sensitive one or being shied away from or there's some sort of trauma and everything like that I mean do you have like quick tips or like sort of like certain little exercises that you think that someone can do on a daily basis if they need to just feel just be a bit more assertive in a conversation that they may need to have at work or if they Mm. just want to be able to speak and be heard a little bit more 
in their own family even you know if they are the shy one if they are the one that they feel gets overlooked what what things can they do whether it's tapping or a vocal exercise that they could do well the first thing um what you've said is so interesting about your growling and feeling that resonance in your chest mm -hmm. and it being quite frightening for you at first because what it sounds to me like your teacher was doing with you is helping you to build a, a trust relationship between you and your body mm -hmm. and being able to know that your body will carry you um, and that there's actually there's more there's way more space to resonate in your chest than in your nose or in your head you know um, what I would say to someone who is shy, somebody who has quite a small voice um, and it doesn't quite feel natural to them, and everyone knows whether that's the truth for them or not, is to start to build up that trust with the neck below. Yeah. And so I have an exercise um, to just take the sound um, into your chest. So something like this. Mm -hmm. And really just, it might make you feel really silly, but really feeling those feelings of the sound traveling from your head all the way down and what that feels like. Mm. And just doing that every day to kind of just, it's like um, an anchor on a ship, mm. if you can imagine that. And so, mm, ah, you're kind of going from quite high to the lowest that you can do. And as you're bringing the sound down, you're imagining this anchor coming down into your body. And this anchor, like it does to a ship, it centers you and it grounds you and it solidifies you. And that is a power move right there. Mm -hmm. Just that thought of being centered and solidified, like grounded. That helps you to articulate. And you know, whatever we rehearse and practice, we get good at. So if you have practiced being shy, not being heard, then you're very good at that. So to reverse something that you've been very, very good at is gonna take some time, but it takes you being really determined and it takes you visualizing who you really are and making that vision bigger than who you are right now and making pursuing that vision as pleasurable as possible because as creatures if as human creatures you know if if we just say oh be disciplined and do it every day we're not going to do it every day we're just not it's the reason why new year's resolutions they just don't work because by february like who's still on the diet seriously you know and even before then it's because we've associated this new diet with deprivation and pain and um, the antithesis of pleasure. Now, when you look at your, your vision every day of how your sexy body will look and the, all the nutrients that are going into your body and you make cooking fun, that's when you're like, oh, I can do this. You know, it's a similar thing with the voice. Who do, you, who do you want to be? And what would it be like to be that person? And you're visualizing it as if it's happening now. So you imagine yourself going to your boss and asking for that raise and that the answer being a yes. You visualize it as if it's happening now. And that is the motivator for you to, to, to incorporate something like that exercise into your ritual every day. So that's what I would say. It's, it's quite a lot I've, I've given, but yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a good, and it's funny what you say about, you know, I've, I've never known a singing exercise that isn't like, if you just separate it from what it is and what it's doing for you, that isn't stupid looking anyway, you know? Right. 
is there one that just looks pretty you know i i can't think of a, a single solitary one that isn't but they all work it's just you have to get yeah that these crazy things actually do make some difference you know but absolutely those are, those are um those are so good as well and and just are, are there any other things that you can think you know are there any other emotional blocks that we tend to put up that stop our voice or, or that you've met with singers that you think they've got an amazing voice. I know that in the past I've met people that just, they, they just can't, their, their voice just like literally trips out of them with no yeah. at all. But yet there seems to be some block in terms of they should be, you know, you know, there's, there's more to it than just having a good voice and, and being an amazing singer and being, having that career. But yet there's just sure. something that stops them going that extra step. Yeah, there are many, 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 many blocks. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest ones is this thought, who am I to have the success that I desire? Mm. Who am I? And when a singer starts to look around them at their community, at people who sing as well as them, and they make comparisons. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, who am I? She's better than me. And who am I? She sang that better than I did. That thinking, or even being around a peer group that compare, even if you don't do it, it starts to seep into your consciousness. And it can, uh, it can really throw you off, but also, Existing in a society where being creative is not normal. Being in a society like ours, being in a nine to five job is normal. So who am I to not have to do a nine to five job? Who am I to be successful and known in the public eye just for being myself? That's just fantasy stuff. It's never going to come true. Um, that type of thinking is the block of all blocks. Mm -hmm. And it even occurs in recording artists who've had success mm -hmm. because you'll have an artist who will do really, really well and have a platinum selling album. And they're like, yeah, but that was a one-off. Who am I to have a second one? Mm -hmm. Who am I to have a third one? You know? Um, there's so much suffering in the world. Who am I to have what I want? And who am I to be rich? Who am I? There's so many blocks. Yeah. And, you know, we kind of, as fetuses, as babies, as children, as adults, we marinate in these blocks every day. Like flowers in a flower pot. That stuff is in the soil. And it comes up through our roots in our system. And we are blooming these flowers of who am I, these blocks. And it becomes part of our conditioning. And we don't realize that those flowers aren't quite supposed to look that way. They could be more vibrant. They could be more powerful. They could be more attractive than that. Um, but we think it's normal because it's what we've always known. So it takes a really courageous and brave person to say to themselves, I want more and I can have more. This doesn't feel quite right. So let me see how I can go and get it. It takes a really courageous person to do that. Mm -hmm. And I remember Tony Robbins saying, you don't get what it is that you want. You get what you have to have. You have to have it. Um, and there's nothing that's going to stop you from having it. And like I said, you know, having that vision of what you want your life to look like, what your singing voice, what you want that to sound like, making that so big that it's bigger than the conditioning that you've experienced. And that becomes more real than the reality that you're in. Yeah. 
And so I, I've got a massive heart for artists, for them to just be well. Yeah, you've got loads of money. So what? Are you well? How are you feeling? Do you wake up happy every day? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. That's amazing. Thank you for that. You know, it's like on so many, on, on so many levels. Thank you for that. Because I know that there's so much of, 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 of my own experience that I can hear from that. And I'm sure when, when, um, when everyone's listening to this as well, they'll be able to hear aspects of themselves, you know, from that, mm-hmm. who am I to be creative when everyone's doing the nine to five? Who am yeah. I to step out of that? But it's like, if there's that voice telling you or just guiding you into this thing if that's what you're attracted to if that's what looks exciting and if there are people out there doing that who are you not to you know and 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 that's why it's so it's it's just inspiring to have someone like you who's who can who can speak on that and say it say that you know what you what everyone looks at as a dream life is a reality for so many people doesn't make it any more easier but it just takes that mindset of positivity and dreaming and staying there and we need more creativity in the world you know I think we're slowly getting to the point where we're turning around and creativity is not a hobby creativity is what life is all about you know we all have to be creative we all have to contribute to society in our individual way and this is what's going to turn things around you know when we just need mavericks like yourself talking it and reminding everyone that that's the way as well so thank you for that and and i want to ask some of the closing questions now as well i want to get real some juice from you and find out a little bit more about yourself um yeah what is the best advice a woman has ever given to you <laughs> oh, immediately i went to um my mother mm-hmm. i remember uh because we've got quite different body shapes. We look alike from the face, head up, <laughs> but from the face down, from the neck down, we don't look anything alike. And I remember looking at myself in the mirror and criticizing myself, mm. and saying, yeah, but mom, this isn't right. <laughs> and criticizing my body shape, you know? And she said to me, I mean, she's always said to me, stop it, you're beautiful. Um, but what she said to me is never look at something in isolation. Mm. always look at your body as a whole and those things that I was narrowing down and criticizing suddenly disappeared Mm. so I was like oh yeah that might not be what I want but as a whole can rock it (laughs) so that is I think the best advice I've ever received from a woman you know yeah and, and which woman do you think represents higher energetic resonance? It's got to be Oprah. I don't just listen to what she says. I look at who she is being. She sits in that chair and I watch her body language. Mm-hmm. And I listen to the tone of her voice. And I don't know if you've noticed but if you, if you listen to clips of Oprah over the years, her voice, her speaking voice was higher yeah. than it is now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Her voice has traveled, 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 traveled all the way down into her chest. Mm-hmm. And it's such a rich tone, which was always there. But it signifies to me her journey into wholeness. And that anchor that I spoke about, she is so solid sitting on that chair. She's never seemed needy to me. Mm -hmm. She's never seemed like she's trying to get the interviewee, interviewee to say something so that it's good for her. So it's not just the things that she says, she knows who she is. And she is relaxed and centered in herself. And that is so attractive Mm. to me and to millions of people around the world. Mm. And not to say 
that you know you found yourself when your voice is deep <laughs> that's not what i'm saying at all i'm saying that there is a connectedness within yourself which will change your voice yeah. which will because your voice like i said is just a manifestation of who you are being and the more connected your vocal folds are definitely is the more connected to yourself you are yeah. um and the more anchored you are yeah. so yeah good good on oprah you know. did you did you see recently i think it was last night or or just over the weekend she um donated five million dollars to a school mm. in Atlanta. I'm trying to remember the name of him now. Um, and I, I, was what, I was watching it. It was posted on someone else's Instagram and it was one of her... I'm going to quickly look at it so I get the name right. Um, but she, 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 she's had him on her show for a while. His name is Ron Clark and he is a teacher. And if you ever look at him, if you look him online, he's got this academy where he was from the Deep South and he went up to Harlem, white guy from Deep South, he went up to Harlem and he was a teacher and he just knew that he wanted to teach in these schools. And so he's this like Southern, at the time, you know, kind of like young white teacher and went in there and just turned the schools around where now people come from, teachers come from all over the world to be involved in his academy. And even Oprah herself with her own school has flown him out and his team out there to pass on. Um, their teachings and the way that they're teaching schools but she was there mm. celebrating 10 years of the academy and she went yeah. on and she was just saying thank you and everything she's like I was going to match you know like that people's donations but I'm going to give you five million dollars and I just thought that was just an amazing thing not only to do but then also to be able to do because yeah. I think from from and not just from the point of view of just being having five million that you can just drop it's like in order to have five million you have to be you have to be able to hold 5 million or 10 million or 20 million and, and being able to hold that amount of abundance is no small thing, you know, because no, it's not. people have money and it, and it, and it leaves them as quickly as it comes if they don't have the embodiment, you know, like you're talking of the voice and, and that's as it's probably as she's got more abundance in all different ways that her voice has become richer and, and, and mm -hmm. yeah, she was able to do that. And I reposted it because it was just like, it was a, it's a noble thing, uh, an, an amazing thing to be able to do. Yeah. To be able to have got to that stage in your life where you just, I can do this. And, mm -hmm. and, and that in itself was inspiring. I'm like, who do you have to be to be able to be able to do that? And mm -hmm. to change on that level as well. So she inspires me. There are so many women, but she's definitely, you know, one of, one of the top, top on the list. Yeah. And, and as uh, you were talking about it, um, I was kind of scrunching up my face thinking, do I remember that? But it does sound vaguely familiar. Yeah. But yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's just one of those things that you're just like, if you couldn't love her more, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, what's your favorite self-care ritual and self-care practice? Oh, well, I've just started doing something I call my miracle morning. Mm. I wake up. I meditate on uh, self-compassion, intimacy, and I journal, I visualize what I want, what I want my outcomes to be. And I sit there and I ask my body, what is the steps that I need to take to get to my goal, to manifest this thing? And my intuition answers me back and tells me what to do. And then I get up and I do yoga and I just breathe and stretch and open. And by the time I'm finished, it's around an hour. And sometimes I get caught up thinking, should I be taking this hour? But yeah, it changes everything. Mm. My day is more relaxed. It's less frantic. I don't like rushing. I used to rush all the time. and I don't like it. And my miracle morning helps me to have that boundary 
where no, let's not do this meeting now, let's do it tomorrow where I have more space. So as I'm creating space in my mind, I'm creating space in my body, I create space in my day. Perfect, good for you. And what's next for you? What's next in your business, in your life? What's, what's coming up? Well, things are uh, in a very transitory stage in my business and in my life. Um, I have been serving recording art, uh, sorry, I've been serving aspiring artists and session singers, helping them to get into the industry and coaching them on that level. And I made a decision to get to my first love, which is the recording artists. They're, they're the reason why I started the company. And to just coach them and to really give them my laser focus and give them everything that I've got to really help them. Because I, I see myself and I see recording artists and anyone who shares the mentality of self-love, pleasure first will change the whole music industry. Yeah. It will change everything. And the irony is, and there's always irony in spirituality, that when you put love first, you actually earn more, not less. And um, you don't have to compete and it doesn't have to be greed or strife or undercutting people or you don't have to do any of that. Things flow a lot more because the music industry at the moment is thriving on fear. It, it, I mean, I, I shouldn't even say thriving, it's surviving on fear. Um, and making their money back, making a profit. There's so much fear, my goodness. And when you put love first, love for yourself, love for your voice, love for your fans, love for your music, things flow and they're, they're not... <sighs> What's the word? It's like this spiky energy of it's so hard and toil and sweat. And <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way. It just doesn't. The so minds, that kind of oh my god <laughs> the, the, I'm, every day i'm hustling you don't have to you really don't <laughs> so um that is my mission um, yeah. to really infuse that into the industry for sure perfect and and these are the times you know it's it, it's a change in times it's a it's a switch in times anyway and it's a more i just fit it, it it's 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 still in the dawning of it but there's mm. more and more people that I'm connecting to now that are more heart centered in their business. And because yes. like say, they lead with love and they lead with a, a mission of service. If you go mm. with those two things first, as long as you're not speaking for someone from a very business minded, who wants to see the stats and everything, if you kind of go in there with that heart first. It does flow and come in in a way that mm. is so easeful that oh. the grind and the hustle, you know, it's, you work hard still, but it never feels so much because like you say, if you have that morning practice and I have a morning practice as well, and mm. you know, sometimes it can stretch as much as two hours, but it doesn't feel like that because as soon it as it doesn't, does it? No, You're like, whoa, is that the time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And as, and the, the practice that I do, cause I do Kundalini yoga. So it's a sadhana practice. Mm. So I get up usually around about four, four thirty in the morning. So it sounds wow. like it's crazy early. But then once you're done and then you kind of get up and into the day, it's like, oh my God, it's only like half six. It's like, well, you get, you get so much done. So by the time it's like midday, one, two o'clock, you've been up for hours, you know? Yeah. And, and so much is done and it's so easeful, so easeful, you know? And it, admittedly by about like eight, nine o'clock, I'm kind of tapping out. Right. It's got so <laughs> yeah. much done during the day that yeah. you really feel that I'm missing out on anything really. And it, and it yeah. just... I, it, the way that everything just kind of like comes into place it's almost like you know what do I need now the thought mm. and then it all aligns and comes in it's, yeah awesome it, it just works that way and, and it's just nice to speak to more and more people and collaborate you know that's yeah. the, the word we switch in that competition for collaboration 
and and beautiful things will happen I'm sure it's my intention for it to be like that anyway so yeah um so I just want to know so how can we further connect with you on on the internet online wherever your your space is so I'm on the socials mm -hmm. Instagram and Facebook um if you just search my vocal therapy you'll see me there um the website is myvocaltherapy.com you can check me out there um yeah there's i've got a twitter but i don't really use it that much so it's mostly instagram and facebook fine and youtube my vocal therapy on youtube you can subscribe I've got some great content coming up that i'm sure people will really enjoy as well brilliant Thank you. So thank you for today, Charlene. Thank you for taking your time to be part of her conversations. I really appreciate the wisdom and the insight that you've brought into this space. And I know that I've learned so much and I know that others listening to will learn a lot from you. Thank you again. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's so nice to be included. Thank you. No problem. Thank you once again for joining me for another episode of Her Conversations. And also remember to subscribe, whichever way is the best way for you to hear this so that you can get notified the instant that a new episode is uploaded. And if you need to get in contact with me in any way, my website address is carolmaywittick.com. That's C-A-R-O-L-M-A-E-W-H-I-T-T-I-C-K.com. Or you can find me on Facebook under the same name, or I am on Twitter and on Instagram under Kazmik, C-A-Z-M-I-C-K. So enjoy the rest of your week and I'll see you again and meet with you again and speak with you again next week. Take care.